just multiple pictures, all of the same thing. Okay. All right. Here's what we're going to do now. And you can do this with, let's get into, we've got a lot of it. Let's get into like groups of four. Okay. We're going to turn this in. We're going to make some groups come up and like read theirs. We're going to see if it's right or not. What I want you all to do, okay, is we are going to go and write out step by step by step every structure, every signal going from the motor cortex in the brain all the way down until we finally get sort of a cross bridge and a power stroke and therefore force production in the muscle. So I want you guys to list all of these things out. Everything we've talked about in the last two days. Okay, brain all the way down, major structures, signaling molecules, major receptors for those signaling molecules. We mentioned it. That's what I want you guys to do. So find some friends, meet some new friends, whatever. And I will give you guys 10 minutes. Ready? Go. Is there something else I can tell Okay, yes, Riley. Yeah. All right, I need two volunteers. Riley, come on, it's great. Okay. Here we stand right there. Riley, come stand a little bit away from her. Okay. Now, here's what we're gonna do. Everybody, you see Riley, you see Kurt. Think in your head. Your life depended on it. Which one of them can lift the most weight? <laughs> We're going to do a bicep curl. Okay? Bicep curl. If it was Monday, we would have said bench press. Because we're going to do a bicep curl. That's easy. Okay? Would anyone care to volunteer their choice? How? Okay. So, but you're you're okay. We're gonna we're gonna hold on. We're gonna vote for Riley. Okay. Anybody else want to share? <laughs> what about the same? Okay. Avery says the same. Okay. So Callie said she has seen Riley bench press, probably in my class. Yeah. Um, and, and so she knows, even though we're not bench pressing. Okay. Whoever you've picked, think about why you picked that person. Okay. Why? We'll try again. Anybody else? Anybody want? Just tell me who you think it is, or just tell me why you think one person might be stronger than the other. I mean, we can find out, but why? The key thing is why. Ty, what do you think? <laughs> okay, her legs look strong. <laughs> Okay, okay, there we go. All right, we're talking about leg strength and doing a curl, but it's okay. It, it does, it does, but you remember specificity, right? Okay. This is why you don't mess with things. Okay, it's fine, Bailey. I know, I was going to say Bailey. 
You haven't had me before. Please, never, ever in the history of the world use the word tone again. So it is, and it's an incredibly imprecise and misrepresented word. I know exactly what you mean and why you would say that, but that's okay. So it's like fingernails down an old school chalkboard to me. We don't say tone. It's okay. It's okay. All right. We think Riley, right? Okay. Ladies, y'all can go and sit down. Thank you. Yeah, I'm like, can I, can I do it just I mean, so I can prove we, we got more things. You can come back up, Kirby. You can try in a minute. We're going to need more volunteers. Now, here's the other thing we can do, okay? Otherwise, look around the room. Look at everybody in a very non creepy way. Look around the room and think the same question. If your life depended upon it, who would you guess has the strongest arms? In class. Regardless of, like, gender. Regardless of gender. Remember, Abby, our life depends on it. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. We've been looking around, we've been doing things. Okay. How? What? You have to tell me who, right? I didn't say who, but what were you looking for? Um, big arms. Big arms. <laughs> okay? Big arms. Anybody else? Is that what anybody else is looking for? Show of hands. You're looking for big arms. Okay? Right? Emily, your arm, your hand's not up. What were you looking for? I'm sorry I missed it. Okay? Anybody looking for other things? Other than just big arms, Kirby. Like, 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 like shorter arms, right? You know, like, less range of motion. Yep. A little easier for them to lift more. Like, you can spot that with the swing. Mm -hmm. That's the guy with the long torso and the short arms and the short legs. Yes. <laughs> I, my baby T Rex arms. Right? <laughs> if you've had him before, we joke around in the black household. My wife is 5'3", I'm 5'10", our waist is at the exact same place. We would wear the same length of pants, okay? <laughs> she has no midsection and these like super long like arms and legs, right? She cannot buy pants um, or tops if she has a hard time. And I'm all midsection and like no arms and legs. And we're curious to see what how Ellis is gonna turn out. Will she be like in the middle and be proportional? Or is she gonna be She's at that age, kids at that age, they're all long torso. They all have like short, they have those things. So anyway, okay, so that matters, right? That matters. Anything else? Okay. Is there a question we should ask people that might also give us information? That help us make our decision. Okay, but Claire, what did you say? Yes, right. If you work out, do you do curls very often or not? Right. You could have great big muscles, but if we ask you to do something you're not at all used to doing, then it may not work very well. Right. So. I ask you all these questions because that's what we're going to talk about. Okay. What are the things that determine how strong you are? Okay. What are the things? Well, we're going to go through a list. And you guys caught several of them, right? How big your muscles are is really important. The architecture of your muscles is important. Okay. Do you work out or not is also important, but it's going to have an effect on some other parameters. So we're going to talk about how we put all of our big signaling pathway into motion. This is a sort of on paper physiology exercise, right? This signal, this signal, this signal, boom, 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 boom. That's fine. Every time you move, every time you do anything that requires a muscle contraction, you're doing every one of these signals over and over and over and over and over again simultaneously in many muscles to be able to walk or run or jog or lift weights 
or write or type on your computer, whatever it is. Okay. So this is what's happening from a physiological standpoint. We're now going to talk about putting that physiology in motion. What is that going to look like? How's it going to manifest when you go to do stuff in your everyday life? Because that's what you're going to do, right? You're not going to go work out and think, boy, let me think about this. Got to get my dendrites since some, some action potentials right now. No, you're thinking move, right? This weight is heavy. Get more force or I'm about to fall over. Adjust my balance or something. Okay. So we're going to talk about how all of this stuff actually fits together in real life. Okay. And so we're going to start off by talking about different kinds of muscle contractions, which I know you guys have seen before. Okay. And then we're going to get into what are the things that are going to actually determine how strong you are. So because it's easy and everybody can think about it being a relatively simple kind of movement, we're going to talk about a bicep curl. Okay. Talk about a bicep curl. I know you guys in anatomy talked about muscles being agonist or antagonist or synergist and things like that, right? This is not the first time you've seen this. I've seen all of the slides in health fitness. No, okay. Because I made all of them. So when we do a bicep curl, I'm going to get the two pound weight. Okay. When I do a bicep curl, right, the primary muscles that are moving, the muscles that are going to shorten, we're going to go through a cross bridge cycle. We're going to pull in the cross bridge cycle, shorten our sarcomeres, pull in all of the connective tissue, pull in the tendon. Tendon connects down here to the radius or the ulna. I forget which one. Oh, I don't know. Also never had anatomy. Yay for me. Okay. Pulls and we do a curl. Okay. The primary movers, the ones that are going to shorten when we do a sort of a flexion exercise, those are what we call agonists. Those are the agonists, the primary muscle group that works. Okay. Now, there are what we call antagonists. As I do a curl with my bicep, my tricep with the extensor at that same joint is going to be the antagonist. You may not think about it, okay? But I know Braden might have thought about it when he was holding the curl here, okay? When we ask you to pick something up and do a curl, even though you don't think about it, you're still going to get some contraction from your tricep. I should run the EMG to show you guys, okay? So when an agonist works, the antagonist also generates a little bit of force, usually to try to stabilize the joint. When these two things work at the same time, the antagonist is said to be undergoing what's called a co-traction. So the agonist contracts and we get co-contraction or simultaneous contraction from the antagonist. It stabilizes the joint. For today, that's all we're going to talk about. For tomorrow, we talk about one of the things that happens and how the nervous system learns to contract more efficiently, to let you get stronger, one of the things that it will do is you'll get less and less antagonist co-contraction whenever you do any kind of agonist. Talk about how that happens. Okay? You also have muscles that are called synergist muscles, which are in essence assisting muscles. Okay? They are not the primary mover, but they will help the agonist move and, and kind of help with, with that, that muscle action that we're undertaking, okay? Sometimes, and I'm not going to um, name names on the particular workout things and everything else, but people like to focus on working the synergist muscles at the expense of the agonists or the antagonists. And I don't think that's the most sort of efficient way to do that. That's how we're gonna classify our muscles, okay? Those are gonna be the classifications. Okay. Kirby, you want to do contractions? You can come on back up if you want. Okay. Pick a weight of your choice. I don't care which. You're going to do several, so just keep that in mind. Yeah. All right. Just, just we're going to do one, then we're going to wait, and we'll do a couple more. Okay. So, Kirby, do a curl for me. Curl up, and then go back down. Okay. When she curled up and the agonist was contracting, what type of muscle contraction was that and why? 
concentric, right? Her biceps is shortening, okay? So concentric. Can we hold it up and just hold what we had Braden do? What kind of contraction is this? Okay, why is it isometric? One person, I don't care who. It's not moving, right? We're neither shortening nor lengthening. Okay, now Kirby, go down. As it goes down, lengthening back down, what kind of contraction is that? Eccentric. Okay, pause for a moment, okay? Kirby has 15 pounds. In order for her to do a concentric contraction and pick the 15 pounds up, how much force does she have to generate from her bicep? Do it for us. Do it for us, Kirby. Okay? I heard it over here somewhere. How much force must she generate? More than 15. How much more than 15, Howard? Okay. The thing weighs 15 pounds because of gravity, right? So in order, and this is a really important thing to, to sort of wrap our brain around, okay? To do a concentric contraction where you're picking something up, where it's a flexion contraction, okay? You have to generate just a little bit more force than whatever the weight is you're lifting, than, than what it weighs. So when Kirby comes up, up for us, Kirby, just a little bit more than 15 pounds. Now do an isometric contraction, Kirby. How much force is her bicep generating now? Is it moving? Okay. Does it still weigh 15 pounds? Okay. How much force is she generating to hold it steady? 15, like exactly. Okay. Relax. All right. Isometric contractions with free weights where you hold it steady you're basically matching the force of gravity, okay? Now, eccentric, on the way down, how much force are you having to generate? So that it goes down. A little bit less now. Okay, Kirby could have just dropped it, right? And gravity wins and it goes down in that way. You can set it down if you want, okay? We'll have you come back in a minute if you want to do some more. Okay, right? Okay. There are three primary kinds of contraction: concentric, isometric, and eccentric. Okay. There are some special properties that we will talk about of those contractions. They are going to differ in the amount of energy that it costs us to perform them, and they're going to differ in the amount of force that they're able to generate. Okay. It says it on the slide that you have. But we're going to talk our way through how we generate force, and we'll circle back to that at the end because I think it will make a little bit more sense. Okay. All of this is going to come down, though. Okay. All of this is going to lead back to cross bridge side. All of this is going to lead back to the number of cross bridges and the amount of active endurance that you have in a muscle. Okay. So, if we talk about the things that are gonna to lead to how strong someone is, here's gonna be sort of our primary list of parameters that we need to think about, okay? First and foremost, it's exactly what almost everybody in here, what you guys pick, okay? And that's muscle size. This is a gross generalization, but in general, Bigger muscles are stronger than smaller muscles, okay? So looking around, Alice said, who's got the biggest arms? That's not a terrible way to guess it. Who's, got, who's the strongest, okay? Now, that's not always true, but in general, it is, okay? In general, it is. So why, back to this, why would a bigger muscle Okay, you guys have seen this before, I imagine, in health and fitness. This is a MRI cross-section from my dissertation study of my quad. It's not a piece of steak, although it kind of is. Why is a bigger cross-section? Why is a bigger muscle generally stronger than a smaller muscle? 
More fibers, maybe. Where does force come from? Is the frustration, okay? So if a bigger muscle has the capacity to be stronger than a smaller muscle, and force comes from cross bridges, that inductive reasoning, deductive reasoning, whatever it is, what can we what can we make an assumption of? A bigger muscle has the capacity to do make more what? Cross bridges. Okay. Bigger muscles have more actin and myosin in them. They may not have more fibers. Okay. They may not have more fibers. But they definitely have more actin and myosin. So they have a bigger capacity to generate force because they have more cross Okay. So we're going to work our way through each one of our parameters and the things that play a role in force production by thinking about it in that way. Force always comes from cross bridges. So you've got more or less cross bridges. Or if we do movements, and in some instances, certain kinds of movements generate less force than others, the assumption is they allow us generate fewer cross bridges. So we'll talk about that. Okay? You guys with me so far? Okay? Good. Okay. Now, as we all know, if you've ever been to the gym, if you've ever worked out, if you've ever done anything, if you're carrying boxes, right? You guys had to move out or something or change apartments soon. You got to carry boxes, your roommates, right? Just simply having a bigger muscle does not mean that you're going to be stronger than somebody. Else, okay? It's not always that simple. It's not always that simple. So we need to try to understand some of the other things that are going to play a role that are going on with that. Okay? Those of you that took anatomy here, you did a cadaver dissection. Did you guys talk about conation angles in muscles? Do you need to look at the line of pull of the muscle fibers within them? Okay. So we call this muscle architecture. Okay. All of your muscles are made up of muscle fibers. They're all made up of actin and myosin and these things. They all have tendons, they all have connective tissue inside of them. But different muscles are going to have their fibers sort of lining up in relation to their tendons in different ways, okay? The angle at which, the angle at which the fibers run in relation to the tendon is called a panation angle, okay? Panation angle is really, really important. So this is gonna show some common ways or some common types of panation angles in muscles, okay? This is what's called a fusiform muscle. The example here is the sartorius. You can also say this is the bicep, okay? This is the bicep, looks like this, okay? The line of pull of my bicep is straight up and down like this. My tendon runs just like this. And for the most part, all of the muscle fibers in my bicep are gonna line up in the exact same arrangement, right? As they shorten, they're pulling directly in the exact same direction as the line of pull of the tendon, okay? That's called a fusiform muscle. Not all of your muscles look like that, okay? Here is a hamstring muscle, the semimembranosus, um, which is what we call a une or a unipinnate muscle. You will note, here's the tendon, and then the fibers are all going to come in or attach to the tendon at an angle like this, okay? Here is the rectus femoris, so the muscle that runs right here in your quad. It has fibers that come in from both sides. You're going to come in like this, okay? And then your delt is just kind of like fan, just kind of like the, the pec major. They're going, to, they're going to be a little more kind of diffuse than what this is going to be. The reason this matters and the reason that this has an impact on force production is very, very simple, okay? Who's had biomechanics? Three of y'all. Okay. Who's had physics? Any more? Okay. I'm going to say a word and don't don't freak out. Vector. You guys remember vectors? I'm doing rolls our eyes. Vectors. Okay. 
When we talk about things in motion, the application of force on an object, okay, at different angles is going to move that object in different ways. You all do this in your everyday life. If you ever played a game of pool or anything else, you think about this, but it's also happening in our muscles, okay? In a fusiform muscle, okay, my muscles contract. This is the line of pull. My bicep pulls the chair directly towards me. Okay. All of my force is going to be imparted on the chair in exactly a straight line with where I want it to go. Okay. In a unipinnate muscle, okay, when I contract my muscle, it is going to come at an angle towards me. I'm pulling on the tendon an angle like this, okay? When it, this thing moves at an angle, it has a vertical component and a horizontal component. That's why it comes at an angle, okay? But what you have to imagine with this is that the tendon pulls in one direction, but since the fiber is coming at an angle, not all of their force is going to get transmitted in this sort of vertical axis. We're going to lose some of our force production because of the pinnation. The muscle can generate just as much because of its acting the myosin, but not all of it gets transferred onto the tendon. Okay. And so this is a thing that we have to consider. Now, we're not going to talk about, you can put this thing in here. You can actually measure these things. You can take the cosine of the pinnation angle. You can resolve the vectors and you can figure out if I'm generating. 100 pounds of force from this muscle, I'm only getting, you know, 85 pounds actually transmitted to the tendon. Okay. Now, it's even more complicated than this, though. Okay. And I'm going to introduce this as a concept. And I just want you to know what it is. I'm not going to make you do any further calculation. Okay. Normally, when you think about how big a muscle is, what we think about is a cross section. Take my bicep and you cut it right across like this. Or you take my quad and you cut right across like this. And the larger the cross section, larger the number of fibers all pulling in roughly the same direction, the stronger the muscle is. That's good if you have a fusiform muscle. Okay? It's good for the bicep. It's less good for other muscles. We have this idea of something called physiological cross-sectional area. And a physiological cross-sectional area is going to be taking into account the pinnation of the muscle and the size, the actual relative cross-section of that muscle, okay? And the easiest way for me to try to illustrate this to you guys is with this particular question. I'm not going to make you do individual calculations like it was a graph. Imagine, here's my bicep, okay? We cut it right across in a, in a fusiform muscle, a physiological cross-section, what we call an anatomical cross-section where you cut right across, are exactly the same. In my unipinnate muscle, though, if we look at what's going to be basically a right angle with my fibers, then here would be an anatomical cross-section would be this wide. But if you line up where the fibers are going to actually be going like this, you get a bigger area, okay? It's a longer thing. When you have a multi-pinnate or a bipinnate muscle, let's just say like the rectus femoris, it actually runs down and around on both sides. And so in this way, I have pinnation, so I lose some force from the pinnation, but it allows me to increase my physiological area by a very large amount. And so this arrangement actually gets more force transmitted to the in an arrangement. All I want you guys to know, I'm not going to make you calculate this. Um, if you're curious, I don't know that I actually put the ultrasound. Yeah, I did put the ultrasound image in. If you want to know what your what your pination angles are, come downstairs. We'll go to Dr. Pelowan's lab. We'll get out his uh, Doppler ultrasound. You put it on the surface of your muscle. That's what this is. This is a vastus lateralis muscle. You stick it right out here, and you can visualize. Here is 
It's called the deep aponeurosis, right? This is paramycium on the inside. Here you're going to have epimycium out on the outside. And you can look at these sort of these bright lines that are going through here. This is going to be sort of the individual. These are fascicles rather than fibers, but it's going to show us the line of pull. And so we can measure then the angle that these fibers are going to come in and attach. We can measure a distance. We can calculate all of this if we really need. Okay. So this is why it's a long-winded answer to this is why the architecture and the arrangements of fibers in your muscles matter. Okay. You may think bicep, right? If we just measure actual cross-section like this, your bicep might be bigger than some other muscles. It might be bigger than your rectus femoris. When I mention your rectus femoris, actually can generate more force than your bicep can. Maybe not in everybody. But in some people, because it has a, a larger physiological cross section. Okay. All right, let's do a five minute break. We've been in here about an hour, a little over an hour. Do a break, and then we'll keep we'll keep rocking and rolling. Okay. Now The next several things that we talk about outside of understanding how the different metabolic pathways work together next week, this is going to be the most conceptually difficult stuff that we do in class. Okay? So I really need your attention in the next 10 or 15 minutes. And when you inevitably get confused by what I tell you, because you will, and that's a me problem, not a y'all problem. I need you to tell me, and we'll try to keep working our way through. Let nobody get that, okay? All right. If the first thing we'd want to look at to see how strong you are is how big are your muscles, okay? How big are they? What's their architecture? Then probably the second most important thing gets to this idea of what we call motor unit recruitment and motor unit activation. In a very general sense, what this means is how much of the muscle that you possess can you contract at any moment in time, okay? It does you no good to have a big muscle if you can't turn all of it on when you need to, to run or jump or lift weights or something else, okay? So... You have some capacity based upon how big your muscles are. But then within that capacity, there's going to be a lot of differences among people on can you reach or max out all of, and use all of that muscle. Okay? So when you get an action potential generated in the alpha motor neuron that then travels down the axon, goes through all of our steps, and leads to the formation of cross bridges. We say that motor neuron and its fibers, that motor unit has been recruited. Okay. When you turn on or make one alpha motor neuron and its fibers fire, that's called recruitment. Okay. That's called recruitment. I will talk about what activation is in a few minutes, but it's a slightly different thing. In the world of neuromuscular physiology that I do research in, if you confuse those two things, people yell at you. I'm not going to yell at you, but there is a semantical difference and it matters. Okay? So, in your muscle, okay, in your muscle, you are going to alter the amount of force that you generate by turning on more or fewer motor units, okay? Trevor, do you want to come back or want me to pick somebody else since you just had some salad? Whatever you want. You, you said you wanted to lift, so come on, if you want to, okay? <laughs> I That was what I heard in my mind. All right, Trevor, pick up, then do a curl with the two-pound weight, please. Okay. She needed some amount of her muscle, right? to generate just enough force to overcome that two pounds that gravity is exerting plus whatever her tricep is doing, okay? How hard was that? For how much, how, what percentage do you guys think of all of the fibers in her bicep did she use to do that? Okay. 
Five to 10? Probably, very reasonable, okay? All right, set that down. Let's pick up the five pound, okay? Okay? She needed more motor units to fire to pick up five pounds in comparison to two, okay? How many more? I, I, we don't know, but maybe another 10% or something. It all depends on how strong she is, okay? Now do 10 pounds, okay? Even more, okay? Same muscle, same total capacity, but we are altering recruitment, right? A few, a few more, a few more still. Now, do you think you can do the 25? Do the 25. Okay. All right, let me set that one down. How close do you, how much, how much more do you think you do than that? Not a lot, okay? Okay. So that's closer to her max. So that's probably going to be in the 70s, 80s, or 90% of all of her muscle that is turned on. Do you curl reasonably often, or at least mm -hmm. enough? Yeah? Okay. Thank you. You can go sit down. Your capacity, okay, to reach nearly 100%, to turn on nearly 100% of your motor neurons is directly related to how often you use that muscle, okay? How often do you make that muscle have to generate high amounts of force, okay? If you pick a muscle that you don't contract very often and you ask it to do something at a very high level of force for that muscle, if you're, we would say you're untrained with that muscle, you're, you may be able to get 70 or 80% of the, mo the motor units to turn on. Somebody that's really, really, really well trained at a given activity may be able to get upwards of 95% of the motor units in that muscle required. Okay. That change, that ability to go from I don't do it very often, I'm at 70 or 80%, and then I learn and I go all the way up to 95 or 98%. That's one of the primary adaptations that occurs with resistance training that we'll talk about tomorrow. Okay, so our ability to change and alter recruitment is one of the ways that we control force, okay? Size sets our kind of upper limit, and then recruitment is how we're going to adjust our force level within that particular range, okay? Go with me so far, okay? Good. Now, there is a very specific order and manner in which we recruit motor neurons, okay? You are going to turn on the smallest motor units first every time, as long as it's a concentric or an isometric contraction, okay? So when I do two pounds, then I go up to five pounds, I am using the same motor units that I used to get two pounds are going to be the smallest ones, right? I go from no weight, curl, two pounds, I get a few more, right? Up, up, up. Smallest ones go first, and then they stay turned on, and then we add more and more and more on top of those in order to get more and more force, okay? Now, the smallest motor units, are going to have slow twitch fibers connected. Okay, they're going to have slow twitch fibers connected. As we move up through the size of the motor units, as they get more and more fibers in the motor units, we're going to progressively move through slow twitch into 2A, through our 2As into 2X at the very, very end, if you have any. Okay, so small, and slow to kind of moderate in like 2A to very large 2X. Why is that helpful? Why is that good? Why is it good that you would fire the type one or the slow twitch muscles first in every contraction? Yeah. 
less energy is required. Less energy is required. I know what you're getting at. That's not exactly. Well, they probably require the same energy to get the same force. But what are the ones better at doing? Why are they fatigue resistant? You remember our bar graph yesterday? All right, where we had the two bars make and use for the three fiber types. Okay. Remember the type ones, those bars were very close to the same size. As you get into two A's, they start getting farther and farther apart, and the two X's, they get even more so. So Cameron's exactly right. His idea of, right, when we fire type ones, they're resistant to fatigue because. They're better able to match their energy use with their ability to produce it. So because of that, they won't get fatigued. They won't get fatigued as soon as two A's or two X's. Cameron, so they're efficient. They're more efficient. That would be the better. That would be the better thing. Yeah. Okay. And so if I've got to do right a bunch of these, or I've got to stand up all day. Or, I don't know, somebody's got to go make tables tonight and walk around a bunch. Then, if you're doing relatively low force contractions over and over and over and over again, you're using mostly slow twitch fibers to do those. And that's why you don't necessarily get a lot of feed from doing relatively low force contractions. It's because you can track the, those fibers first. If it was the opposite way around, which it might be when you do eccentric contractions. We don't know. Okay, there's some data in animals that is suggesting that it might flip around, um, but we can't really prove that in humans. Lord knows we've tried my lab, and we can't we can't quite get there. But if you did it the opposite way and you contracted the two X fibers first, right? They've got like two contractions in, them and they're done. And they're fatigued, and now you've lost all of that capacity, right? You've lost 20% of your capacity to generate force in the first few contractions because those fibers are just done, they're shot. So that's one of the advantages of going from small to large or really from slow to fast. Okay? It lets us have this ability to walk and stand and things without tired as often as if it was flipped around. Okay. We're not going to get into sort of the neurophysiology of why the same signal coming from the brain, the same action potential is going to cause the, the, the smallest motor units to go first. There's a thing called the Hindemann size principle. It has to do with the size of the motor neuron and the ease at which they can reach threshold potential based upon their size. Um, if you want to know about that, you can go to the um, you can go to the biomedical engineering department and class called quantitative physiology. It may be the however bad you guys might think physics um, or biochemistry or something is. Think of the math of bio, behind all of biochemistry and physiology. That's quantitative physiology. Okay. One of my best friends is the chair of biomedical engineering at the University of Mississippi. He teaches quantitative physiology. He sends me stuff. I'm just like I. Like, this is just the worst. like the entire class is like, okay, yesterday we did all that membrane potential stuff. They like calculate all of that. And if you add this ion and this concentration, what happens and why does it go? And I'm like, ugh, yuck, who cares? All right, that's what goes on here. There's one other advantage to this. There's one other advantage, okay? Any of you have like really a lot younger brothers or sisters or cousins or something that you've seen try to write or color like toddlers, like three or four year olds? Or maybe you work like a church and you, you keep those kids, you work at daycare, you do something. Can you describe Bailey? You put your hand on. What does it look like trying to watch a toddler write? What are they doing? They're not very good at it. Outside the lines. They go outside the lines, okay. They're not precise, okay. What else do they do? I get a lot of this every day. We color a lot, which is great. But Colin, what are, what, are, what are you doing there? 
right? We hold it like this. Yeah, they go to town, right? What do toddlers lack that fine motor skills? What would happen, okay? What would happen if, imagine, let's just say that the largest motor unit in a particular muscle, that type 2x motor unit, might have enough fibers that it can account for, say, four or five percent of the total force with that muscle. Whereas the very initial ones can account for like a tenth of a percentage. Okay. If you went and you got a full five percent versus like 0.1 percent, what's that going to do to your fine motor skill? What's that going to do to your ability to very precisely control in small increments the amount of force? It's going to fuck it all up. Okay. And that's what toddlers don't know how to do yet. Okay, they have not practiced and learned how to precisely recruit like two small motor units rather than 12, right? So anytime we do fine motor skills, writing, okay, playing the guitar or a cello or a musical instrument, all of those kinds of things, we're going to need to very precisely control force production. And so by going from small motor units to large, it gives us a big range to finally control force on the bottom end, okay? On the bottom end. Because most fine motor skill things are not like doing a one rep max squat. Okay? You're not generating a huge amount of force. It's a small amount in a very intricate, very delicate. So that's the other advantage. We get fatigue resistance and we get an ability to precisely control force and have fine motor skills. So, again, this is structure, right? Size of motor units, structure, signaling pathway, imparting our ability to function. We won't cover it in this class, but you may in others. Anybody remember what happens to the size of my motor units as I age? Anybody remember? Bigger. Does your grandma have as much fine motor skills as you? No. You lose some motor neurons and you get re innervation, so your motor units get bigger. It's not her fault. She can practice all she wants. She may have lost some, some of those motor units, and so her, her motor units get bigger. You lose the ability to finally control force. Right? People that have different kind of neurological impairments, we may see the same kinds of things. Okay? Really, really important stuff for occupational therapy, inpatient, physical therapy, and things like that. Yes, Cal. So, yes, yes. As you age, I, the aged person in the classroom, as you age, some of your motor neurons will die. Okay? When they die, the body has one of two things that can happen. They will die, muscle fibers lose the connection to that motor neuron, then those muscle fibers will die. Okay? Weird kind of thing. Or what we will try to do is motor neuron dies, the axon of an existing motor neuron we will try to branch off and reconnect to those fibers. And as it does that, it actually switches the fiber type to whatever the new ones are, but then it makes the motor unit. Now, instead of having 100 fibers, now it's got 200 fibers, or it went from 1,000 fibers to 5,000. So it's an adaptive process to try to maintain strength and function, but that may come at the expense of some level of fiber. Okay. okay, I'm going to try to show this and illustrate this to you guys with an interactive kind of thing because it's really important, okay? I'm going to pick up my two-pound weight, right? I need one motor unit to do this. It's a small motor unit. It has a smaller number of fibers in it. Note that the fibers from that motor unit are all throughout my muscle, okay? As I move up and I go from two pounds... 
to five pounds. I get a second motor unit. That's not enough. I can't lift it. Okay, get a third. Okay. I'm still getting somewhat larger motor units, more fibers, still type one. Five pounds now to 10 pounds. I'm going up. I need more. Now I bring in a two egg. Now I apologize. One, because it apparently is the same color on here. Um, but also you will note that I put the type 2A in here. There's actually not more 2A fibers than the other ones. That's an oversight of my design, um, mostly drawn out of laziness, um, but there would be more fibers still. So I would go up to a 2A. <clears throat> I'm gonna go from 10 pounds then to 15 pounds. I get another one. Now I'm gonna do some sort of maximal effort. I'm gonna try to lift 20 pounds and I bring in the 2X motor units at the very, very end, okay? So you do this every time you move anything. Anytime you contract a muscle in your body, you are doing this without ever having to think about it. And it happens basically instantaneously. It is rarely a one, think about it, okay, maybe two, now three. Your practice throughout your life of lifting things, of doing particular activities, you know intuitively, okay, I need 70% of my muscle to do this, roughly. And so you basically just go bing, 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 right through all of those almost instantaneously to get to 70%. And then if that's too much, then you can back off a little. If it's not quite enough, you can do a little bit more. Okay. So it's, it's a discrete process, but it happens really, really fast. As you all, who's oh, loaded question? How many of you have ever lifted weights? You we usually get a couple of people in class. Okay. All right. When you do a set, right? I'm going to do a set of 10 with some amount of weight. The first ones feel easier than the last ones, oftentimes, right? Okay. As you lift the same weight more and more and more multiple times, the ones at the end, you may actually have to recruit more motor units to, to keep lifting that weight because some of the initial ones are going to get tired. And that's why it feels more difficult because the amount of neural input from the motor cortex that goes to turn on more and more motor units, we sense that, we perceive that as being effortful, okay? And so you're like, I'm really trying hard. I've really got to work at this at the very, very end. That's because the motor cortex is having to send a bigger signal to get more and more of this to go on, even though you're lifting the same amount of weight. And that's why things feel the way you do. Okay. I'll still with you. Still doing okay? Yeah. Good. Okay, we covered all of this. All right. We're going to take like a, like a two-minute sort of basic physiology break and then we're going to put this basic physiology into practice as we talk about muscle activation. All right, this was a question, I believe, on the quiz today. Okay. There is a thing, right, that we call the active state. That period of time after the ryanidine receptor has been opened and calcium comes out of the sarcoplasm in particular. Okay. It has been released out and it can interact with troponin. It will stay out until the circa pump, until the, the calcium ATPase has pulled all of it back in again. It will take, you know, I don't know, 50 milliseconds or something. As that happens, okay, that period of time when calcium is in the cytosol, where it can interact with troponin, is called the active state. The active state. Okay. You must release calcium from the SR to get cross bridge formation. If that doesn't happen, nothing happens. Okay, nothing's going to happen. So the length of time, the length of the active state, is going to be directly related to the amount of cross bridges we can form or we're likely to form. Force production. Okay. 
If you can lengthen the active state, make it last longer, there's more calcium, more time for calcium to bind to troponin, there's a greater chance we're going to get the cross bridge and therefore more force. Okay? That's what this is. Now, there are very specific sort of kinetics or kind of a time frame on this release of calcium and what this is going to look like. And that has things that are going to be different between fiber types, and therefore it's going to have things that are going to be very different for how we're going to get force out of different fiber types. Okay? So this is the active state. The circa pump is what brings the calcium back in. Okay, That's going to be important. And so we can actually, we can't do this in you guys, we're going to kill you. But one of the things they do in animal models or in isolated muscle fibers is if you put caffeine, if you bathe a muscle in caffeine, this is so like you guys have, some of you guys have energy drinks or something, if you have a cup of coffee, you guys are getting um, sort of uh, what we call a millipolar dose of caffeine. If you get a much larger, like an order of magnitude larger dose, like you had like 300 cups of coffee. That amount of caffeine actually makes the active state taller and longer. You get more release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and it stays out longer. So, in animal models, if you dose them with a bunch of caffeine, you get a stronger muscle, right? You get less fatigue if you do that. Caffeine does the same thing in us, but it just doesn't do it by interacting with the human, okay? It's much more of a central nervous system. Okay. Now, this is what's going on here, okay? My next parlor trick I'm going to shock myself. Or I can shock one of you guys. It really doesn't matter. Okay. I apologize that I've got to come all the way over here. Does. How many of you have ever had electrical stimulation like at a PT clinic or something? Right? You've had TENS or something like that. A lot of you have. Okay. This ain't PT spin, let me tell you that. Lovely, like a mess of wires here. Very nervous, but now I'm going to borrow you for just a second. Okay, I am going to use this to circumvent all of the motor cortex things. We're going to jump with this all the way down to one action potential on the axons going to my muscle. Okay. So I hit this orange button and it fires one action potential. You guys can see. Okay, one action potential. So I get an action potential. I get a little bit of calcium release, right? Interacts with troponin. I get cross bridges. I get force production. The action potential is gone. Circa pumps all the calcium right back in. 
it shuts off, I get a relaxation. Okay. Again, all of this happens in like 50 milliseconds. Okay. The more juice I apply, the more of this I'm going to manage to get. I mean, can you come up and hit the and just hit the advance on the thing? I didn't really think about this very well um, as we as we did this. Okay. Thank you. Things to understand. Okay. This is important, and this is going to be important for understanding fiber types and understanding why some people are better sprinters than others or better endurance athletes. Okay. When you give one action potential, we call that a twitch. Okay. My muscle twitches. Okay. If you were to graph the force production in my bicep when I do this, it will look something like those curves on the right. Okay. You will note I'm showing curves here from the muscles around the eye, from the first dor dorsal interosseous muscle, the muscle that moves your uh, index finger out, from the gastroc or the soleus down here. They put their soleus one in the wrong place, or down around the sural nerve down in the. Okay. The speed at which the ryanidine receptor releases calcium, and then the speed at which the myosin ATPase can cleave ATP and get us force and go from one cross bridge to multiple, okay, is going to tell us something about the slope of that, the front side of that curve, okay? Note how the, the one on the top, the eye muscle, it's much, much steeper. One action potential force goes up much faster. Okay. We can calculate something called time to peak tension or rise time, which are going to tell us how quickly a muscle can release calcium, form cross bridges, and take up and generate force. Okay. Fast twitch muscles because their myosin ATPase is faster. We'll do this faster. Okay. I can take you guys, every one of you guys, down to the lab, hook you up to this, give you some twitches, and I can rank everybody in class. Okay. Based upon your rise time, and get a rough approximation of who has the most slow twitch fibers to who has the most fast twitch fibers, just by doing this. Okay. I can't get any kind of percentages, but I can I can tell you guys roughly where we're going to fall. Now, on the back end, you can get a parameter that we call half relaxation time. Half relaxation time measures how well the calcium ATPase or that circuit enzyme brings the calcium back in. Okay, so which and then it shuts off. The faster I can bring calcium back in, the faster it will shut off. Fast twitch muscle fibers have a faster circuit enzyme than slow twitch fibers. So they can relax faster. Okay. So this is one of the reasons that having a faster up on our force and a faster down means that we can get through one action potential and then get into the next ones faster. So that's why you can run faster. So you can sprint faster if you have more than two. Okay. Again, it all comes back to the mechanics of the cross bridge and that physiology from calcium release to component binding to cross bridge formation through the cross bridge cycle to that relaxation. Okay, speed of all of those steps actually determines why some people can run really fast. And we test all of these things experimentally. So, all right, I mean, can you come and hit us to the next slide, please? Okay, thank you. Now, in that context, okay. Matthew, not wearing his Cardinals hat today. Can you send one action potential to your quad muscle right now? One of the link. We don't know, right? 
Okay. The answer is generally no. Okay. You can't. Whenever you do a muscle contraction, you're not getting one action potential like this. Okay. You're not getting one, you're getting multiple. The number of action potentials that the central nervous system sends to the motor neuron, therefore to the muscle, in a given period of time is going to be called firing rate or firing frequency, okay? It introduces a concept called neural rate code. And it's the rate of action potentials in a given, say, time window. You're getting X number of action potentials per second, okay? Maybe it's two action potentials per second. Maybe it's 10. Maybe it's 50. Remember from yesterday, we talked about the idea that one of the drawbacks of using action potential is that it's an all or nothing signal. It's on or it's off. There's no in between. Okay. It's not like a neurotransmitter where you can give it a little bit or a little bit more or a lot. So the way that we modulate sort of how on the nervous system. So a little bit is a bunch is by this idea of rate tone. This idea of if I want more force, I send more action potentials in the same window of time. Right? So look at our graph here. What this is, these are data taken from they stuck little needle electrodes into the first dorsal interosseous muscle of the person. I've seen this done, I've never had it done to me, but it didn't look real pleasant. But all of these little, they stick all these little needles in. The needles pick up electrical signals. And what they do then is they say, okay, lift with your index finger at increasing amounts of weight. And what you will note then is every spike on there is an action potential. So at a low force contraction, you will see how relatively infrequent those action potentials are. And then as we get more and more force, we get more and more action potentials in the same time. So we will increase the firing rate or the rate coding to try to get more force. Okay? This happens within every motor unit that has been recruited. Every one of them, okay? You turn it on, and then within that motor unit, you modulate the number of actions. So it looks something like this, okay? And so what happens, you can't really see it in me, I can feel it, but if I go one, two, three, four, or I go, right? You can't really tell, but I can feel I'm getting a little bit more force when I put all of those right on top of each other than if I just go one, one. Okay. And part of this, the reason that increasing the fire rate, rate gets us more force is going to lead right back into lengthening the active state. Okay. So, let's see if I can put this off. Or you buy the thing with electricity in it, turn it off. Okay, so if you came to my lab and we did this, okay, we can give you contractions and we can alter the amount or the frequency of action potentials that we give you. So we give you a one second contraction and we give you five action potentials or 10 action potentials in that second, all the way up to say 100. Okay, and we, we graph out then the amount of force that we get from your muscle, and we express it relative to the most force, we get a curve that looks like this. This is called the force frequency relationship. It's the force and firing frequency or action potential frequency relationship. And what you will see is, as I get more action potentials in a given period of time, I get more force up to a particular place, okay, up to a particular place. 
at some point out here, I can continue to increase the firing rate and force will not go up anymore. Okay, and I'll show you guys why that is. But we get more force because we get more cross bridges. Okay, all comes back to those cross bridges. More force for more cross bridges. So how are we getting more cross bridges? By increasing the number of action potentials. It's through a process that we call <laughs> summation. And what happens is you're going to make the active state bigger by essentially summing or adding together the amount of calcium that every action potential causes to be. Okay? So it looks kind of like this. Here's our one twitch from our previous active state graph. Action potential, force, force right back down. Okay? One twitch. Now, rather than getting one action potential, we're going to give three. Okay? I get an action potential. I get calcium released. I get some force. And it starts to pull the calcium back in. And then here comes another action potential. That second action potential causes just as much calcium to be released as the first one. So I have all the calcium from the first one minus this little bit that's been sucked back in, plus another full action potential as well. So I now have almost double the amount of calcium out in the cytosol. Just double the amount of calcium to bind to the component. So I may be able to get double the number of cross bridges. Okay. I get a second one and I start to then right pull the calcium back in, got farther to come back down because there's more that's out, but I get then I get a third one, right? And these things are going to continue to sort of add together because when you get a second or third or 20th action potential before the circuit pump has pulled all the calcium back in. When the new action potential arrives, it releases the same amount of calcium. There's some left over. Now I have more total calcium that's been released. Okay. So here you can see as we gave, I don't know what this is going to be like, 10 or something. Rather than three, it's 10. And it continues to just go bing, 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 and add up. At a high enough level, at a high enough level, in slow twitch fibers, it's maybe 20 or 25 hertz or action potentials per second. In a fast switch fiber, it might be 45, 50, 70 hertz. At some point, the action potentials occur basically right on top of each other. And so there's essentially no time for the calcium to be, to be pulled back in by circa. And you come up and you get to a place and you're just, we've maximally released calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. All of it stays out until the action potentials turn off. Okay. When that happens, you no longer get a, a sort of sawtooth increase in force. You get a flat plateau at the top because there's just this constant amount of calcium. That's called a complete tetanus or a completely titanic contraction. So again, our ability to use rate coding and changing the frequency of action potentials to modulate force within one motor unit all has to do with calcium release. Okay? One action potential, one active state. As it gets, starts to come back down, you get a second one, more calcium gets released, plus whatever was out there, there's more calcium, more cross Okay, Does that make sense? Kind of, sort of, maybe. Okay. So, What's wild about all of this? When I lift this 10 pound dumbbell, okay, I have, let's just say, 25 motor neurons that have been recruited to let me lift this 10 pound dumbbell. Okay. In those 25 motor neurons that are firing, in those 25 motor units that are on, the individual firing rate may be different in every one of them, okay? And what it does is lets us see what is basically my favorite graph ever, okay? This, 
I think illustrates how the, the nervous system combines recruitment and firing rate to get to a certain amount of force, as well as anything that I've ever seen. So let me show you guys what we have. We have every line that you see on here represents a motor unit, okay? On the x-axis is force production, so there's no force or a very small amount of force and a very large amount. Y-axis is going to be the firing rate, the action potential firing rate within each within each one. So when I get a little bit of force, I turn on one motor unit and it's firing at eight hertz. When that force needs to be a little bit bigger, I have two options to get more force. I can recruit a second motor unit or I can increase the firing rate within the one that's beyond. And so initially we're going to increase our rate, increase our rate. We're getting more and more force. We're going to get to a place where this one is on, it's at like 16 or 17 hertz. Then I turn on a second motor unit. Okay. To get to this level of force, I need one unit at 18 hertz and a second unit at 8 hertz. When I need more force, we, we sort of move both of these things to the right. So we start alternating them both, and then eventually we add a third. And so what the nervous system tends to do, it wants to recruit the smallest number of motor units and fire them at the lowest possible rate that it can to get whatever force you need, okay? Any extra firing, any extra force cost us extra energy, and we don't like that. That's how all of this is gonna to work together. Very small muscles, like the muscles in your hand, the muscles around your eyes. They're not very big. They don't have a huge number of motor units. Small muscles tend to mostly modulate their force production by changing firing rates. Big muscles like your quads, it's a lot of motor units. And so it primarily modulates force by adding or subtracting motor units rather than there's, there's, But there's some give and take. All right. How do we feel about this? Every time you walk, this is what's happening. I like picking up your stuff, pack up your bags. This is what's going on in your muscle. You never think about it. You never think, oh, I need eight action potentials per second in this one and 12 in that one, like this. Is how we control force production and why we're able to do it so precisely. Okay, that's all for today. I will see you all tomorrow. Please make sure you turn in your interaction pathway assignment. If you did it on your computer, email it to me. If not, please bring it up, get it like same on it. All right. I got it. I don't know. Come up with more activities. What? Yeah, okay. I don't know. So I'm not so I'm not gonna be there tomorrow. I'm not going to be here tomorrow. We're not going to be here. Yes. And then the funeral tomorrow is at one o'clock. So I don't know if I can take the quiz. I don't know. I can at least do you that. It's probably easier for us to take the time. Okay. Okay. What would it be? Um, like, yeah, that's right. Yeah, here's what I want you to do. Put that on my on my calendar. But I want you send me an email or a text message. Okay. The numbers on the syllabus at like eleven. Okay. Did I blast him in the thing? Make sure.
Okay, even though I'm gonna put it on my schedule. Okay, then that way you pay it. And then I'm Friday. This is okay. Okay. Make sure it's okay. And then are there going to be any like in class activities and stuff? Okay, there are. I really have to Okay, thank you. Um, sometimes it's just kind of whatever I manage. Um, also, it all kind of depends too. If people aren't paying attention. Probably not tomorrow. Probably for sure there will be one. We do resist the training stop on Friday. Okay. So, and then the lecture is on the YouTube channel. And then for study for the test, what do you recommend the best way? I know a lot of people have had your I had Alex last semester for a little bit. You probably use roughly the same test. Because I was a study guide and then I studied that. I would say if you know most of the stuff that's on the stuff that we're doing in the lecture outlines, um, you can keep an understanding what those things are. That will be a mix of multiple choice and a grade, otherwise, so it will not be all essay. There will be some multiple choice, so we some short answer. Um, you know, maybe some you know, real awesome things out mm -hmm. or some other sort of hot layer. So the test will probably look a lot. From like how much Alex changed my test from the things to what people look a lot of things. What the choice part thing will tend to be all of the following statements about the actor say are true set of the you will have to know multiple things. To be able to teach you a little bit, very fun to kind of put things around for them. So, the actor say is the amount of time it takes for the professor, not how I'm supposed to get it. Yeah. There will be things like that that will be there. Details, precision, signal, and you will be today. Pretty much 800 and so it's a little, this is the molecule that's the signal. This is what the receptor is. You think atoms right after this. This is why slow units are going to be first and support the most transport and the smaller things So you know, it will be a fairly and the first one everybody will get used to what the first one is like. Is the final cumulative the God. Okay. No. And then, um, you know, I know there was some talk yesterday that for about how to study sessions, sort of, um, either before class Monday or fairly soon, maybe like the weekend or something, or maybe it would be in person and on Zoom. We will try to have this conversation with probably on Friday. And then we'll call, I'll be sure to run the time. But by that same token, I'll be here all the day. Okay. Yeah, I'll be here. Okay. Thank you. You got it. Yes, sir. Yeah. Big thing of water. Kind of. Yeah. Um, so you get stored. Yeah. I don't remember what part exactly you're talking about. I had to write down the question because I'm going to forget it. Yeah. Like when you get stored, you say the fossil isn't. Specifically, just growing, you're creating more cross bridge, more cross bridges, or more affinity for cross bridges. Okay, well, let's go we'll back up a step. Okay. okay, you are sore generally after a day or a couple of days after the eccentric contractions. So, lengthening the down portion of the curl is what makes you sore. Down portion. Bench press the down portion of the squat is what makes you sore. Usually, you're going to be sore when you've done an eccentric contraction to a movement you're not used to doing or with a relative. You're sore because that lengthening contraction, the nervous system is not very good at how it recruits motor units in the right way, at least initially. 
And so you overstretched the serpent. And you ripped the serpent's part. See, you damage to the tissue, immune system. Well, no, for this is a consequence that your body telling you, right? Hey, there's damage in this muscle. Maybe we need to take it easy. One of the things that we can know is that there is some evidence that doing eccentric attractions is called a wage. I think it ought to be also about setting out. That doing any sort of traction seems to be a little bit better than so pressure for you on the center So we think that there is some level of an adaptive response to a little bit of muscle damage. Part of that repair process may make the muscle at very least it's going to make that those muscle fibers come back right away. But the lifting of the heavy weight, we're going to be eccentric. May damage some, but it provides a bit of So, we'll talk about this. Talk about what provides that muscle mass. Okay. We will get into like, we'll get into cellular signals. We'll talk about how we drive protein synthesis, and those things. Right. We'll talk about inhibitor, talk about the inhibitor, we'll talk about where testosterone goes into the We try to the one power we can get well, there'll be a lot of questions. Protein. So we'll get into that. That's yeah. that's what's happening. We know you don't have to ever get sore. Yeah, you don't have to have any muscle damage. So the idea in some ways that. I'm not sore after I've done the workout. Good enough workout, or I didn't work hard enough to get muscle growth. It's completely false. Especially if you have people who lift a bunch. If you lift the same thing or pretty close to the same thing several days in a row, there's actually an adaptation where you may get quite sore the first time you do something, you get quite sore the first time you throw up a bunch. And then that actually protects you from damaging future months. Yeah. And so if you lift a bunch, it's actually harder for you to get sore unless you do something brand new than a person. If you take a person that's never has not lifted in say six months, it doesn't matter what we do, we take them and they're going to be sore. But it's business. If you take them they've been working out for six or eight months, we're going to do a lot more to them because they've already adapted to them. One of the things that we study in the lab is what is that, how long does that process take? What are the things that are changing? So muscle growth. I guess this is my last question. Yeah, sure. Muscle growth is it more prosperous? Do you have more? Yes. Or is, is it more muscle like? So yeah, how does it? Because I know so you can't it, gain muscle fibers. You can't. So within the fiber, the fiber itself is going to get. It's going to go from like this. It's going to get bigger. Out like this because that tearing and rebuilding. Sure. Or from the, the tearing and rebuilding may be a consequence of all of the work that we did in our workout. And all of that work also, in addition to causing the tears, may lead to hormone release. It leads to changes in the these receptors for those hormones. It kind of wrinkles the circle limb up. Um, and it like transmits force and that causes some signals in itself in addition to the day. But all of that drives protein synthesis. What happens is, remember, inside the fiber, there's all those little neck smaller tubes, those myofibrils that are made up of circuitry. But what happens is, for the fiber to get bigger, you just add new myofibrils. So you add more and more circuitry. Okay, so you do not fiber. The yeah. fiber, myofibrils, you get more myofibrils. And so the fiber itself is going to get bigger, and there's going to be more amount of fibers in there. So it's hard to get back the miles. How do you create more myofibers? That just so the um, so the nucleus that's going to be in there. You're gonna you're gonna activate the genes in the nucleus that code for all of the 
Make up the individual sarcomeres. So you make new sarcomeres and you just attach those sarcomeres to each other. You get enveloped. Kind of like pop out. So you say you have all your little myofibrils right here. This one just kind of like pop out to the side. Like you have an extra myofibril and another one. I believe that is the case. That's a lot of I am not 100% certain because we can't, we can't really visualize all of so very well. And they can grow like fibers. You can make a fiber grow like a petri dish or a test tube or something. And look at the different stage. You know that we would get, we just get a few more miles. Whether whether one monofibril like splits into two, or you just start a brand new one. It's just the same process for older over time they lose that muscle mass of myofibrils. That's so interesting because again, I know there's so many hypotheticals and stuff that like I haven't found yet, but like that's such an interesting thing about myofibrils just absorbing that to each other and like disappearing. They're the ultimate in some ways, the nervous system and the muscular system, like kind of the ultimate use of the use of this thing. And they're going to be the symbiotic relationship we talk about. We do the, the adaptations as well. That if I if I cut the nerve connection to the muscles, the muscle will die. The muscle fibers will all die. Yeah. Um, something about using the muscle, something about sending signals down that nerve, one keeps the nerve happy and healthy. But that also seems to stimulate and allow us to maintain the health of the muscle fiber as well. The cast and stuff. And as long as you don't have damage to the neurons, you can you can regrow some of those connections. You can regrow um, when you do stuff with lungs, you actually have more neuromuscular junctions than a person that doesn't lose as much on the same level. So how would you grow more junctions? That stuff is very classic if you kind of come and go. Um, as long as the as long as the cell body is they would basically cut what we would think of as the typical nerve bond that the little rats and then you can put them on a treadmill. Even though it couldn't voluntarily make it go, there's a reflex um, um, to basically we have it, but it's not nearly as pronounced by people in quadrupeds. If you move the leg through and you get to they sense heel strike, and you get to heel strike, and that reflexively causes you to plantar flex and push. And so there can be no thing, but you can still get the movement pattern out of the rack or treadmill just by the fact it's all this sort of reflex thing. And they could find that when they would cut a nerve, that it would eventually mostly grow back if the animal didn't do anything. When they made it try to do that reflex thing, walk on the treadmill, it would grow back faster and it would grow back a lot tighter. The connection would come back a lot better. And they could figure out if they could exercise the contralaterals and fix it over here. All things that, you know, if you, when we do exercise physiology, you know, that's how nervous system works. Like my guy's boss, he was in neuroscience. They could never do the exercise. That's the coolest thing I've ever seen. So, right? I just cut some nerves in the back of my leg and I'm like, Trained it and they would do it back stronger. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. We, can but, use, we can use these things. We use this kind of stimulation in as it has spinal cord injuries, making that the plates that we use these things more efficiently. So, it's an electric dinner. They got like 100%, also got twice as big in six months. We put ankle weights on them, had them sit on the edge of like a chair or a bed like this, put big electrodes on their legs, and they they couldn't do it. They just zapped themselves until they would just take their leg out with lift the weight, break it back down. And they would do this two times per week, four sets of 10, 100 percent So all the nervous system type of things still work, they just lack a connection. And so you can the peripheral mechanisms, you can make it fire, it all works. Interesting. Thank you so much. Good morning, man. We'll see you tomorrow.
Good. I didn't know if you needed help bringing us that down. So uh, that yes, that would be that would be fabulous and outstanding if you could do that. How did glass go up? This, I've never had an edge this. It's going, I think it's going great. Can you condense all this material into a summer class? Two hours and 15 minutes. Yes, Ryan, you're lurking. You need me? Or are you just like looking at what have I done? Oh, okay. Excellent. That will be very useful. Yeah, math is something that we on paper back. Oh, I'm the old right. The before there was a phone that had a Google map on it. Listen, I was around when the GPS started becoming a thing. We were around before. I, was I, around. Just, I just remember like long road trips as a kid with my parents that just bought maps for the area. Yeah, when yeah. yeah. you get to a big city, there'd be a little insert map for the big city. Yeah. 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 I'm not I'm not that you young. Know, you are that young. I don't know how old you are, but I'm just gonna say that you're pretty young. Uh, let's see. I had a guy at a bar the other night. He's like, 